for refugees. Thanks for staying until the end. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of Ben Cooper, who did the modeling work for the study. So um, hepatitis E virus is thought to cause about 20 million infections globally every year, about three, three million symptomatic cases and about 70,000 deaths. Um, about 20% of those that are infected develop clinical symptoms and we see a case fatality rate of about 2% in non-pregnant cases, but this increases tenfold in pregnant cases. Um, MSF has uh, responded to a few um, outbreaks, most recently in Darfur, Uganda, South Sudan, and Chad, all of which were refugee emergencies except Chad, which is a, an urban emergency. Um, hepatitis E is endemic in um, Asia, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. It's estimated to cause about 10% of pregnancy-associated deaths in Bangladesh and maybe 10,000 pregnancy-related deaths in South Asia. Transmission is fecal-oral, and although hepatitis C e virus has been isolated from surface water bodies in Darfur and in South Sudan, there's an increasing body of evidence that indicates that person-to-person -person transmission within households is the most likely explanation for the transmission patterns that we see. In terms of um, control, water and sanitation responses, um, I thought uh, the impact of water and sanitation responses is uncertain. And in terms of treatment, uh, options are fairly limited, only supportive care, really. But there is a vaccine. It's safe and effective, and it's called Hecalin or HEV239, but it's only licensed in China in 16 to 65 year olds that aren't pregnant. Its effectiveness was deduced in a large scale randomized control trial um, that was published in The Lancet in 2010. Um, and that was carried out in an ed endemic region of China. Um, but its impact, its potential impact in an outbreak setting is uncertain. So we decided to look at that through mathematical modeling. Firstly, by estimating the key epidemiological parameters that are associated with transmission, that's things like the basic reproduction number that tells us how many secondary cases will result from an infected case. And then use those parameters to build a mathematical model where we can then explore the impact of uh, vaccination both before an outbreak occurs, that's preemptive, or after an outbreak has already occurred, that's reactive. And then to go on to look at extending the vaccina vaccination coverage to other age groups um, and pregnant women for which the vaccine is not yet licensed. So as I said before, MSF responded to an outbreak in Uganda in 2000, between 2007 and 2009. It was in a refugee camp in Kitgum in the north of Uganda and resulted in 10,000 cases and 113 deaths. About 50% of those cases occurred in just three of the camps, that's Agoro, Madiope, where the, where the outbreak started, and in Palago. So we fitted a deterministic compartmental transmission dynamic model to the three outbreaks. I'll ex oh, let me just explain very quickly what that means. Uh, basically, you can divide individuals in the population into different compartments depending on their infection status, and then they move between these compartments depending on transmission dynamics. And I'll explain that a bit better here. Uh, model one shows an SEIR model, and individuals can be um, divided between these four compartments. S for susceptible, that's not immune and not yet infected. E for exposed, that's latently infected but not yet infectious. I for infected and infectious. And then R for recovered and immune. The bold arrows point to the direction of um, individuals between the compartments. And the dotted arrow indicates influence. So in this case, infected and infectious individuals can influence the rate at which susceptible people become infected. I'll only show the results for model one, but as you can see, we explored six different models that um, expressed the uncertainty around trans transmission dynamics, 
but they all gave broadly similar results. So this is the model fitting where we adjusted the, the values of the various parameters until the model fitted outbreak data. Here in circles, we see the real data. That's the weekly number of hepatitis E cases in each of the outbreaks in Agora, Madiope, and Palaga. And if you look at the colored solid line, that's the model fit. So you can see that we have pretty good fit to each of these outbreaks. And then during that model fitting, we can home in on the, the true values of the model parameters. That's moving from the peach color to the red color. Um, and so a much narrower definition of the, the parameters. And similarly, we use Bayesian analysis to explore the uh, vaccine effectiveness dis distribution from the Lancet, Lancet article that was published in 2010. We assumed um, a coverage of 80% and a dose interval between the first and second dose of one month and between the second and third dose of five months. There was no data in that trial um, to show that um, any effect from a single dose, so that was excluded from the analysis. So we plugged all of those parameter distributions into the model, and this is what we saw. This figure shows the reduction in the number of cases in gray, the number of total deaths in yellow or orange, I'm not sure what you see, um, and, the no and the number of pregnancy, uh, deaths in pregnant women um, um, in blue. And on the left-hand side, you can see the different groups that are vaccinated. And this uh, figure shows reactive vaccination, that's um, vaccinating using two doses after the first 100 cases of an outbreak. And we can expect to see up to about 30% reduction in the number of cases and deaths. The figure on the right shows the same scenario, but reacting much earlier after the first 50 cases. And we can see that we can, see, we can expect reductions of up to about 45% in both cases and deaths. But the thing to remember here is that the vaccine is only licensed in 16 to 65 year olds that are not pregnant. So when we're looking at the other groups, we're assuming that it's a safe and equally as effective in those groups. And another thing to notice is that in this scenario, if we're not vaccinating pregnant women, we're having no impact on deaths in pregnant women. And that's because we're not responding fast enough to achieve herd immunity when we need it, which is actually at, at the start of an outbreak or before an outbreak. So that's what we investigated next, preemptive vaccination before an outbreak starts. And you can see already that we're seeing much larger effects if we vaccinate before an outbreak, um, if you compare to, to the top row here. Um, another thing to notice is that if we vaccinate everyone else except pregnant women, we can see an effect in reducing deaths in pregnant women. And that's because we're now starting to see an indirect effect of, of vaccination moving towards herd immunity. Another thing to notice is that if we simply add pregnant women to the group that's, that the vaccine is already licensed for, we can see that we don't see much effect on the number of cases, but that we do, actually maybe I should use my pointer. Um, we don't see much um, effect on the number of cases, but we do see a huge impact in the number of total deaths and the number of deaths in pregnant women. And if we use the whole of the three doses before the first case preemptively, we can, and we're vaccinating everyone, we're moving towards herd immunity um, and reducing almost 100% of cases. So in conclusion, reactive vaccination can lead to important reductions in mortality, particularly if we implement this early in an epidemic. But there's potential for much greater impact if the vaccination is preemptive, particularly if the vaccine can be shown to be safe and effective in pregnant women and children and older age groups above 65. The results were robust to extensive sensitivity analysis with different model assumptions, but it's unclear to what extent the results were generalized to an urban setting such as the current outbreak in Chad 
and to endemic settings such as what we see in South, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And these need both future further research. And these are my acknowledgements. Thank you. Thank you, Ruby. Before I open it up, am I correct in thinking that uh, the vaccine is currently uh, contraindicated in pregnancy because they haven't really researched it? That's uh, in pregnant women, right? Vaccines have never been tried no, out. Well, there, um, there were 37, I think, mm -hmm. um, pregnant women that were accidentally vaccinated mm -hmm. in that original trial, mm -hmm. and they saw no severe adverse events. Yeah, all right. So but they were not deliberately included in the, no. yeah. And that is very common in uh, a lot of the life-saving drugs, etc. We find that pregnant women and children are, are sort of contraindicated, not because there's real danger to them, but because there's just not enough data to mm. say that it's not dangerous. All right, questions? Come on, it's the last session. You can ask anything you want. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask if there is any cost effectiveness of this uh, HEV vaccine in comparison to water treatment or other control me measures which can prevent HEV. Can you tell us a little bit about the cost of the vaccine and... Uh... Um, actually, I can't. We haven't done any cost effectiveness studies. But also, in terms of the water and sanitation responses, we haven't, done, we haven't seen any clear impact of water and sanitation, and so it's difficult to compare the two. What's the cost of the vaccine? Do we know? I don't know. All right. Okay. Um, yes, Alan. Thanks. How common are hepatitis C outbreaks in the places where we work? I know there was South Sudan, but has it happened anywhere else where we've had to respond to a big outbreak of hepatitis C? Yeah, we're almost seeing them routinely in our refugee settings. Um, I've responded to three outbreaks in my time. And I've responded to three refugee emergencies, so yeah, all of them. So um, yeah, it's it's certainly a concern. Fairly for us. common. Yeah. Becoming more common, I think. All right. Oh, one more question. Hi, Ruby. Great presentation. Not many people can make mathematical modelling under, sort of understandable. Um, is there any mileage in looking at single dose vaccination? especially given kind of MSF's recent work on single-dose cholera vaccine. And secondly, how much did you include water and sanitation interventions in any of this? Or is, is there not that much evidence towards showing there's an impact? Um, actually, through this work, we were also looking at the impact of water and sanitation in that Uganda emergency. But, and I think I've presented this in the past, that we simply responded too late in the Uganda. The, the outbreak had already peaked in all of the camps by the time we'd got our water and sanitation response together. And I think that's quite common for um, our water and sanitation responses. Um, in terms of single dose, absolutely yes. Um, we um, asked the authors of the Lancet paper if they had any data on single dose, and their study just simply wasn't powered to look at single dose vaccination, so they couldn't give us any data, but that would obviously be the ideal scenario for MSF. Thank you, Ruby. I'm very glad that you worked peach into your presentation, <laughs> especially in the week where Trump bought peach between Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>